uh, I'll uh, start by saying there may be some interesting spelling mistakes. I've got this new automated speller, and I found that it turned um, elective healthcare into pubic healthcare. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, your slide changer doesn't work. And no, no, that's mine. That that won't work. That definitely won't work. Oh yeah, there you go. Phew. <laughs> right. Um. Hey. Eh? <laughs> um. We had the 1938 Act, Health Act, uh, gave the right of every New Zealand citizen to free access to healthcare. You know. It was the envy of the world, and yet we seem to have forgotten about it. The main attack to that act came actually, hold on, what's going on here, with, um, with the health reforms. The health reforms really were all about trying to reverse the Health Act of 1938. They started with this thing here, the Core Services Committee, I don't know if you remember that, that was going to say what we did do and what we wouldn't do. That was 1992. It was a complete flop. So actually what they did is they gave the woman who led it some sort of high honor, and they changed its name. But they came back, and they came back with what was called the National Waiting Time Project. That was supposed to bring transparency, honesty, and equity. And I don't think there's ever been a more blatant lie portrayed on the New Zealand public than that particular proposal. Just to let you know what happened in Canterbury alone, by September 2006, we'd refused 24,000 patients a first specialist assessment, and we had dropped 22,000 people off the waiting list. We just scratched their names off the waiting list. Here we are, on one day, we dropped 4,400 people off the waiting list. Uh, I haven't got much time, but I'd, this is really important. If you think about this, if this is the community here, and this is the reserve of need for healthcare in the community, and this were a pipeline that leads away to treatment down here, what we've been doing progressively and systematically is putting more and more constrictions in this pathway very carefully, actually. And what's happened now is we're controlling precisely what we'll allow to come out. This is referred to in official documents as altering the trajectory of demand. A hateful metaphor, actually. This is the charity hospital. I'm, I'm putting this in now to buck myself up a bit because uh, I'm so proud to show you that. Now, the Minister of Health says that this is a, said at an official opening thing that's a waste of time. It's not needed, he said, the, not the, the Canterbury Charity Hospital. Uh, all I can say is that since it's been opened, we now have a state-of-the-art hospital which has treated 13,000 people that have been refused treatment by the District Health Board. The problem is we don't exactly know how big the problem is. That's the problem, I'm afraid. That is a big problem. We need precise numbers. I hate numbers, but unfortunately they change minds. We need to know. And I can tell you that all of these countries have measured it. Even Sierra Leone has measured it. Admittedly, it was American money, but they have measured it. And we haven't. We are allowed to measure what's needed for primary health. That's general practice, because the government doesn't see that as their responsibility, see? But when it comes to secondary health, the government has not allowed anybody ever to actually measure it. There's been two attempts to measure it, and they've been both by private organizations. The Health Funds Association 
that represents all the private hospitals, have twice run online surveys to try and measure it. There was one in 2013, there was a similar one in 2016. And what they said is that of all the adults that get surgery, there's another 280,000 that need it. And of those, 170,000 aren't recorded anywhere. And that's one of the things about the, the, the National Waiting Time Project. It makes sure that those who can't get through aren't recorded anywhere. Very important. Okay, they, they tried that twice. Unfortunately, the then Minister of Health said it's crap. He didn't like it. He said they're, they're biased. And he said the organization didn't do a very good job. He didn't tell you it's the organization that they use the National Party to get their statistics. <clears throat> Whoops. Uh, so we thought, well, we'll try and measure it. Let's give it a go. So I, I got, I know quite a lot of academics, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. But, but I do know quite a lot of them. We got them all together and we said, let's have a go at measuring it. And they said, we need a three-phase process to do this. We need to do a pilot study first because to get money to do this sort of thing is no joke. So anyway, we did a pilot study to assess, and this was secondary, that's hospital need, and we did that, and we published it uh, last, this year in the New Zealand Medical Journal. And this is how we did it. Um, we surveyed uh, 1,200 people in Christchurch in Auckland. We got GPs to record them uh, cases as they saw them. We got, and then we did sampling by face-to-face -face interview, telephone interview, and online survey. And firstly, I can tell you that GP recording these cases is a complete waste of time. GPs are now so pressed that you give them a new thing to do and they just turn green, okay? They don't do it. They, they, have not, they have to see and process a patient every 10 minutes. Don't give them another job to do. They don't do it. Of these, online surveys, I'm afraid, are very unrepresentative of the public. Uh, white, obese females who live in Renuera are very frequent responders to this. I'm afraid working people are not. Sorry, it's not meant to be sexist. That's, that's a statistical fact. So you need to do face-to-face -face interviews or you need to do telephone interviews if you really want to know. And we have produced a, doc a, a very, very carefully organized uh, questionnaire that you can use that will get the information on how much unmet need there is. What did we find? Well, these are interesting. For primary health, we found that 16.5% of people didn't attend a GP because they couldn't afford to. We found 4.9% didn't fill out prescriptions because they couldn't afford to. We found 11.4% missed either a treatment or a test or some sort of follow-up because they couldn't afford to. So a lot of people don't even access the primary health care system. But what we found, which was the most interest to us, was that 9.3% reported that they had been told that they need a secondary or a hospital care intervention, and they didn't get it. That would, and if you want to remember a figure when you're talking to other people, that would represent approximately 300,000 people currently sitting out there who've been told they need some sort of secondary care and they can't get it. These were the sorts of things that people recorded. Medical consults, couldn't get those, couldn't get orthopedic operations, couldn't get surgical operations, a lot of dental care. Trust me, there is so much unmet dental care out there. A lot of endoscopies, an enormous amount of psychiatric and a lot of other things too. The trouble with our survey is it wasn't big enough to be able to drill down to actually define the numbers that are these unmet needs. In order to do that, we're going, we have proposed a survey of 12,000 people. We've got an even bigger load of experts, actually. I'm, I hope it impresses people, but we, we have pe people with uh, the, um, CVs longer than my arm. Anyway. Um, and uh, we're, our object is to survey with the power to measure not only the quantity, but the type of unmet need. That's very important. We need to be able to put numbers on these types of unmet need. And we'll, we'll be able to 
do that by ethnicity, income group, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're going to do 12,000 people face-to-face, -face, telephone. It will cost about $1.2 million. Everybody goes crazy when they hear that. I can tell you there is no industry in the world that costs $16 billion a year that would not know the size of their potential market. This is the only one. So 1.2 billion million is a peanuts to an organization that spends that in peanuts. Okay. We've got an application into the HRC. Unfortunately, the HRC is very much influenced by government. The likelihood that they'll actually fund it is pretty small. Never mind, I'll still try. So stage three, if we get through stage two, and stage three is very important, we want, look, the ap operative word, I should have made it even bigger, an independent national survey by a panel of experts every two years. That if we had that, we could say to people, how is your healthcare system performing? You let the government into there, trust me, you'll get rubbish. It needs to be an independent group to do the job. Not only would it help inform people, it would inf in help inform policymakers if they were genuine about where they genuinely needed to spend their money. Numbers are okay, but it comes down to people really. And I think a lot, I, every week of my life, I see people who've been turned down who express feelings of lack of hope, who express anger, who express all sorts of emotions about the fact that the only time they needed the health system, it wasn't there for them. Okay? Every week. And what helps me to carry on is the thoughts of the great philosophers. You know, they weren't obsessed by where or when or, or even who, but why. That obsessed all the great philosophers. Why bother? Well, I nearly died of a very rare disease, so it sort of brings me closer to this guy, John Donne. He nearly died of a very rare disease, but when he survived, he wrote a series of dedications for the chap who became the future king of England. And this is the most famous one, actually. He said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Thank you. <laughs>